that's when it hit me. That's when it really hit me. When I saw injured Marines and injured Iraqis, that's when I realized this is not a training mission. This is war. Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Specifically today, we're talking with someone from our Las Vegas veteran and entrepreneur community. And today our guest is Jessica Vargas. She's a U.S. Marine who deployed to Iraq twice. She's also an entrepreneur and artist who creates beautiful images under her brand, Jess V Art. Thank you for being here with us and thank you for your service. So let's start with where you're originally from, how you came to join the Marine Corps, how did all that come about? Uh, let's start with that and I've got a couple more questions about the Marine Corps. Definitely. So I was born in Los Angeles, California. However, we moved to Las Vegas when I was in grade school. So I consider Las Vegas home. We, my mom was a um, single mother and she found a better opportunity in Las Vegas as far as work-wise. Therefore, we grew up here. This is home. And um, I was in college. No, I take that back. I was in high school when September 11 happened. And my older brother was already a Marine. He had recruited me to join the Marine Corps. And when September 11 happened, I felt a sense of duty, like most Americans. I wanted to protect my country and I wanted to serve my country. Excellent. Well, we've had a number of people on the show who were really influenced by 9-11 as well and, and decided to start their career of service that way. So where did you do boot camp? B.I. So back then woman didn't get to go to MCRD. So it was my first time in the East Coast, actually. I went to South Carolina and got eaten up by the Sand Feast. All right. Very nice. And what was your career field in the in the Marine Corps? Where were you stationed? Where were you permanently garrisoned? Oh, that's a very interesting topic. So I, when I joined the Marine Corps, I joined open contract. I was supposed to do legal administration, but I changed my date to go to boot camp because I didn't want to celebrate my 18th birthday, which falls on Halloween. <laughs> and I lost my contract as a legal admin. So I went open contract and I joined the Marine Corps to not be the specific Latina, stay at home mom with kids, nothing against that, but I wanted something different. I ended up in the kitchen anyways. I ended up being a cook, however, when I went to Iraq in 2003, it was during the invasion and we didn't have our equipment. We moved forward so fast. So I got to have an adventure. I was a able body. So working parties, we built the bases that other Marines would later come and infiltrate or join. We infiltrated Iraq and um, I was constantly security attachments, uh, a driver, pretty much humanitarian work. I did a little bit of everything. My last two years of the Marine Corps, I worked for the commanding general of the ranch house. It's a historical building inside Camp Pendleton. That's where I was mostly stationed besides my two tours to Iraq. And while working for the commanding general, my position was curator. So I had to learn how to take care of artifacts because it's a historical building with a lot of historical pieces dating back to when California was part of Mexico. So I had to learn the history and it was a very interesting career in the Marine Corps. Yeah, it sounds like it. You already answered some of my questions about what you did in your first deployment because you were there you were there, if, if people don't remember or weren't aware, 2003 was the very early days of the U.S. being in Iraq, and there really was nothing there. Uh, I had some friends in the Air Force who went in, and they they took Baghdad Airport. They were, like, some of the first people in, but you sounds like you were one of the first people in as well, and it's it's amazing to hear your experiences of how you how you had to get everything ready so everyone else could come in, and you, you were kind of building things as you get along, as you went along. 
Um, where can you say where you were in Iraq during your first deployment? I have a list that I created, and I believe um, it goes everywhere. I mean, pretty much all the different camps: Coyote, Viper, Bedio. There were so many camps. We were constantly moving forward. So I was attached to the engineers. So mm -hmm. our job was basically to follow the grunts. We were right behind infantrymen in the EODs. So as soon as they cleared the area, and like you mentioned, there was nothing there. It was just dirt when we would arrive. Our job was to fill as many sandbags as we could to make sure we can secure the perimeter. I was given night vision goggles one night and told, hey, if anything moves, you know, you shot, you shoot it. So it was a very interesting time because pretty much we were in unsecure areas. We infiltrated and our job was to build a camp. As soon as the camp was built, we would break down our stuff, our tents, and we were living in two men tents at that time with two people in the desert. We didn't have water. We have the water buffalo. So if you've ever had water from there, it's like drinking pool water. Mm -hmm. uh, it was seriously just move, constantly moving forward. We would spend hours on convoys. It was a very different experience. 2003 from 2004, just a year later, I got deployed again. And this time I was in an actual base where... I wasn't going to leave anywhere unless you were an infantry or interpreter. It was so dangerous that you did not leave camp. When I was in, in 2003, we were still, I guess, everything was moving so fast. I mean, I even made it all the way to Baghdad and I made it to even Babylon. So when I say it was an adventure, I mean, I was a 19-year-old, fearless, naive. At the time, I don't even think my brain registered that I was at war. It wasn't until I had an assignment to help the medics that my brain really, that's when it hit me. That's when it really hit me. When I saw injured Marines and injured Iraqis, that's when I realized this is not a training mission. This is war. Yeah. It, uh, I, I don't think uh, anyone can truly understand it until they, they are in that situation. I was really fortunate uh, in my deployment to Iraq. It wasn't until 2012, and, and m not only was everything already built, we were actually starting to pull things down and leave as, as I was there. But, and, and I was fortunate. I didn't ever have to deal with injured or casualties or anything like that. Uh, so I can only imagine what it was like for you as a young person dealing with that for the first time and, and the, the real seriousness and gravity of what was happening around you. Uh, and can you say where your second deployment was? It was also in Iraq. I don't recall the base for some reason. I can't recall what it was. I want to say it was by all Ma Ramadi, but okay. I don't recall the actual name. It's been 20 years though for me. Yeah, there were there were so many of them. I uh, it hasn't even, it hasn't been that long for me. It's only been a little more than well, I guess it's been about yeah, it's been about twelve years, and I I still have to think about what was the name of that place uh, that we used to go to. So, so yeah, definitely definitely wanted to understand what was different about your second deployment from the first, and I think you really captured that for us. So, what were some of the lessons you learned from your first deployment that helped you in your second deployment, or was it just completely new? Adapt and overcome. Every Marine is a rifleman. I recall just having to realize that things can change drastically. So just being fluid in, in wearing many hats. The first time I was deployed, I was a Lance Corporal. My second deployment, I was a Corporal. So I was in a leadership position and I had to learn how to be a leader in a war zone. And there were situations that were tough. I mean, at that time we were going to sleep every night being hit by motors. 
Obviously, our camp didn't get hit, but they were in the surrounding areas. Every night you can hear explosions. We were living in a huge tent. We weren't able to leave the camp. Our living conditions were better in the sense that we had daily showers. The first deployment, I didn't have a shower for three weeks. I remember mm -hmm. we had to baby wipe everything. We ate one MRE at one time per day because we run out of supplies. So there was scarcity in the first deployment, but it built character. By the time I made it to Iraq the second time, it felt like luxury because we had warm meals. We had showers, we had toilets, and I guess gratitude. That's what I would take back. I remember just feeling grateful for those little things we tend to take for granted. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that that's something that comes uh, m much like your other experiences can only come after you've been through something like that, that, that level of gratitude. As a corporal, how did you help your Marines? Because probably most of your Marines on your second deployment were probably on their first deployment. What were some of the ways you helped them get through that first deployment and grow and become the kind of Marines we all hope they become? You know, that's an interesting question. I actually had some of my friends that it was their first deployment and it was a very hard time for them because they weren't used to being in combat and hearing the bombs, going to sleep to bombs. We had a Marine who I knew since military school had a nervous breakdown. And as a corporal, I had to ask around like what's going on with this Marine. And one of uh, my other friend confided like he's under a lot of pressure, under a lot of stress, you know, it's hard for him. So I had to talk. And there's great leadership in the military, then sometimes there isn't. And at that time, I mean, I was a 20 year old, young coming of age. I mean, I was literally my teenage years I had spent in the military. So it made me grow up fast. I had to talk to the sergeant that was in charge of us and make him aware of what was going on with our troops make him aware that he needed to step in and needed to really make sure that our guys were taken care of. We're in separate tents and I guess there was some hazing going around by other staff and COs and I had to bring it up to the attention of my superior to make sure that, hey, we're already in a stressful environment. Let's make sure we're not hazing our Marines. That was something that as a child, young lady, I had to learn that I have to speak up because suicide in our military career veterans is something that's going on. And actually my second deployment, I do recall being in Kuwait even before we moved forward to Iraq. And unfortunately a Marine, I didn't know this Marine, a Marine from other un another unit committed suicide in the chapel, actually. And it was really hard to be confronted with the seriousness of what life can be. You know, coming from high school where you're stressed over a pimple or a, a test in graduating to this is real life. But not only is it real life. In the United States, this is in another country. And in a way, a lot of the people that joined the military, they're children. So I had to step up. I had to learn that, hey, I don't have time to be a young teenager anymore. I have to become a leader. Well, it sounds like you did an amazing job taking care of the folks who their parents entrusted you with them to try to keep them as safe as possible in a in a combat zone it sounds sounds like you did a really amazing job helping those kids out becoming the kinds of marines we need them to be and looking out for their their health and mental well-being as well so thank you for that so what came after the marines for you how did how did you decide it was time to get out i fell in love with aesthetics while i was in iraq both times 
I started, it was funny. I grew up being a tomboy, not wearing makeup, not doing my hair, not dressing up. I was a tomboy. I used to hang out with my older brother and my cousins, my male cousins and boys. And when I was in Iraq, we would get care packages with magazines. And I would look through the magazines and say, I started telling myself, when I get back to the States, I want to try this girl thing. And I also had... Um, Generate my mom, she's holistic. So I grew up with these home remedies. And when we were in Iraq the first time, we were exposed to brutal sun. So we were all sunburned, our lips were chapped. And I knew, hey, honey is moisturizing. Oatmeal can calm your skin. We have these things. So let me make a little remedy. And then I started being an esthetician, not just to myself, but to the guys. I had a pair of tweezers and I started plucking eyebrows and the guys would be like, hey, do that thing with the eyebrows again. I'm getting sent back to the States and I want my girlfriend to be, hey, how do I take care of my chap lips? So I started kind of falling in love with taking care of the skin, which is our largest organ. I, I was in my close to three years before I had to make a decision whether to stay or not to re-enlist or not. And I had a great job. I worked for the general. I was guaranteed to go to Washington, D.C. and work for the commanding general, the commandant of the Marine Corps. And I was going to be an enlisted aide. My superior was training me to become an enlisted aide. He was really disappointed when I told him, I don't think I'm going to re-enlist. I think I'm going to be an esthetician and, and a makeup artist. And I mean, he looked at me like I was crazy, but... It was something that I really fell in love, especially my before my second deployment to Iraq. I remember I went to get a facial and I became really good friends with the esthetician. And she would ask me, are you scared? And I was able to be vulnerable with her. You know, being a female Marine, you have to be hard. You have to have your berries. You can't show weakness. You have to be this tough cookie. And I nailed that. And with her, I was able to say, yeah, actually, I've been there before and I've seen what war is. I didn't want to scare my mom or my friends and family members. So I wouldn't confide in them. I definitely wouldn't tell my peers this. So it was this safe place for me. It was relaxing. So I fell in love with that business. So when I got out, I became an esthetician in Las Vegas in I love that career. That career brought me my femininity, I want to say. I was surrounded by females, which was something I went from being around guys, guy talk, cursing, to all of a sudden, I have to be this nice esthetician and female energy. So it was a great, great healing career for me. It, it sounds like it was a, a revelation for you, and it sounds like a... Uh, an epiphany to to go do something new and and being an enlisted aide to a general, especially commandant of the Marine Corps, is a big deal. I mean, you made you made a very tough choice. I want our audience isn't always military and doesn't always understand those things. That was a very tough choice to turn that down. That's a very prestigious assignment. Um, but it sounds like you you followed your heart and went off and did did something that really fueled your soul. Yes, yes. I mean, everybody looked at me like I was crazy. I remember when I was working for the general of Camp Hamilton, General Sattler, I got sent to CIA and not CIA, like, you know, the CIA Culinary Institute of America. So I used to assist the enlisted aide to the general and we would do dinner parties for politicians, for other generals, for celebrities. Therefore, I got sent to Culinary Institute of America in New York, and it was such an amazing experience. So when I gave all that up, all my peers were like, are you sure about this? However, like you said, it, aesthetics came into my life for a reason, and it did feel my soul. It was something where, I mean, till this day, the friendships that I made with former clients who now are really good friends, it's therapeutic. We are called skin therapists. 
because yes, we perform these facials, waxing, skincare services, but another thing we are, we're therapists, we listen to other people. We get to know people in their most vulnerable stage in life and they confide in us. And it's very special to have that. Yeah. It, it sounds like, sounds like it was an amazing choice for you and, and the, the right step in path in life for you. And it sounds to me a little bit like this was, this was your first step towards becoming an artist and doing what you're doing now. So tell us, tell us after you left the Marine Corps, you became an esthetician and then what was the path to get to what you're doing now as an artist? You know, it's funny because I hadn't made, again, I hadn't made in, I guess as a Marine or any military member, we thrive on challenges. We thrive on becoming the best, bettering ourselves. I hit a plateau in my career. I was at the top of my career. I worked at a beautiful salon here in Las Vegas. I had as many clients as I could physically take. I was making great money, great friendships. However, there was a void in my soul. And at the time, I wasn't involved in the veteran community. I wasn't even addressing some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress that I was experiencing, I kind of became a workaholic and I pushed everything underneath the rug. But then I ended up losing a Marine friend in a motorcycle accident. He was my big brother. He used to protect me from all the guys in the barracks. I mean, goodness, it was so hard for me to date. He used to scare them all away. He finally gave me the thumbs up to date. I remember it was funny, but he was a big brother to me. And when I saw on Facebook that he had passed away, I didn't know how to cry. I didn't know how to mourn my friend. And I remember going to work stoic and my clients knew something was different with my energy. And I remember they would give me hugs and I didn't know how to accept that. You know, my, my, I was so used to being robotic and just, keeping my bearings and one of my clients you know really confided in me and she told me hey it's okay it's okay to feel you don't have to keep it all in um I started going I went to my first veteran retreat I remember that year and it was a female veteran retreat with Project New Hope and I was around other females and everything they were saying they kept talking about being numbed, not being able to connect. And it resonated. And I just remember thinking, I basically closed that chapter of my military experience. I didn't really talk about it. I didn't really hang out with my veteran friends or military friends. And I remember I missed that. I missed that life. I missed the camaraderie and I made a complete turn. It was like this epiphany in my life. I decided, you know, I need a challenge. I'm going to go part-time at the salon and I'm going to go back to school. I've always loved photography. I enrolled in photography and it was just the best decision I could have made for my soul. I had my uh, teacher, she would give us assignment every week. We were to turn in pictures and she didn't want to know what was right with the pictures. Technically, she wanted to know what does this make you feel? And I mean, you're talking to someone that literally got trained to not feel. I got desensitized. So I had to write a paper about what this image made me feel. Well, I started picking these images, you know, the images that were the Pulitzer Prize image, you know, the Vietnam image where you see that little girl running, you know, with the fear. Everybody knows that image. And I was able to articulate those. But when it was like love or these other images, I just had a hard time. She gave us this assignment and this was the breakthrough. I want to say this was the hardest assignment I did, yet the most powerful one. And it's a picture, she asked the class, 
to do a self-portrait. And through that self-portrait, to show the class something that was unique about us, to be vulnerable. <laughs> I mean, in the military, vulnerability is not something they encourage. You know, you got to be tough. I, I remember. So for me, that was really hard. Then she made us watch Brie in Bra uh, Brown, Brie in Brown, The Power of Vulnerability. So here I am trying to do this assignment and most of the class didn't know I was a veteran. They didn't know I deployed to Iraq. So I went ahead and I took a picture of me looking at a mirror with my military boots on my side and looking at myself and something that no one knew because I wouldn't talk about it was the pain I was feeling, the pain from losing a Marine brother at war. You know, uh, he was my high school crush. Me, him, and five other guys in Las Vegas, we all joined the Marine Corps after September 11. And he didn't make it back. And I never got over it. I mean, how can you get over losing a friend that you knew in high school. Then my other friend had died. So there was a lot of pain. And then like you mentioned before, seeing combat, seeing what combat really is. Hollywood tends to glamorize war and it's not glamorous. It's painful, it's damaging. And I had to show that to my classmates in a picture. That was my breakthrough. And that's how I shifted from an aesthetician to a photographer and artist. That's a, that's an amazingly powerful story. It brings up a lot of, a lot of my own feelings and a lot of my own, uh, having to learn to feel again after time in the service. And I, I was very much the same. I didn't reach out to the veterans community when I first got out and I'm, I'm so glad that I did. And I'm, I'm so thankful for our Las Vegas veterans community because they are here for you when you're ready for that but a lot of us a lot of us go through the i'm not ready for that i'm not ready to call myself a veteran i'm not ready to to make that make that change yet so so uh I'm amazingly powerful and i'm glad you found your way to a vet the veterans community and started to heal yourself a little bit and i can i can see what what some of the beginnings of your inspiration for your art are now, but what are, what are some of the other inspirations that go into your art? Cause you have a wide variety of, of photographs that you take and art that you produce. Yes. My favorite collection I have to say is my better end collection, which I actually have right behind me. If you see that pink flower, it looks just like a pink flower, you know, and this is the woman in me. And I do know that women are the ones that get to rule what goes inside the house if you're married. So I wanted to do a collection for veterans that didn't scream necessarily military and veteran. I do have two pieces that, you know, it's obvious this is a veteran piece. However, what inspired my collection was the retreats I attended. I went through a period of my life where things got dark because feeling is hard, especially processing emotions when you've been numb to them. And I retreated. I went to a lot of veteran retreats and they helped. The one behind me was actually captured in Israel with a veteran organization called Heroes to Heroes. They take combat veterans on a 10 day healing journey. Then I've been to some retreats inside the Grand Canyon with Canyon Heroes, so I found my community, like you said, having a veteran community is beautiful. And here in Las Vegas, yes, we do have an amazing veteran community. And my art was inspired by giving back and raising awareness. Whenever I sell a piece that is veteran related, I like to donate 10% of my proceeds to that better an organization that took me to that amazing location, whether it was in Maine with Project New Hope or Boston. I went there. I, I've actually done a couple of Project New Hope 
retreat. I even took my son after I divorced. Again, another thing that comes with the veteran community or any high stressful job, whether it's first responders, military, we tend to have a higher divorce rate than others. And I was married to my Marine sweetheart for many years. When we got divorced, it was really hard for my son. So I took him on a veteran retreat that allowed my family member to come. And it was so healing. So whenever I go to these retreats and I capture something beautiful, I want to pay it forward by raising awareness and giving back. And that inspired my veteran collection. Now I I am a Las Vegas resident and I have my Vegas baby collection. And that's a very fun, beautiful, neon art. One of my best sellers is my Vegas Vicky. And it's fun to create art. It's healing to create art. I, I'm glad you found something that that is fun and healing for you. Uh, your Vegas Vicky is actually my favorite of all your all your work, and you have some some other really beautiful and really powerful work. But yes, the the Vegas Vicky one is my favorite too. Um, and as you mentioned, you're also a mom. You're a veteran, Marine Co. You're a veteran. You're Marine. You're an artist. You're an esthetician, but you're also a mom. And I'm wondering how that shaped your journey into art and entrepreneurship. And also, what what have you learned about business and leadership from being a mom. Ha, that's a great qu uh you know it's funny because I was the Latina that didn't want to have children. And I got pregnant right before I left the Marine Corps. And my son's name is Jonathan, which means gift from God. And he truly has been a gift. I always joke around because he is my heart. He gave me a heart. It was being a mom was so hard for me because he is the opposite of me. He is an empath. He's an emotional person. And he is amazing. Like he is intelligent and we will get into these debates. He's 18 now, but when he was taking debate in high school, he learned the art of debate and he will use logic and facts and I use emotion and I say so and force. So I had to learn how to not use emotions and force and use logic. He made me a better person. He made me feel again. He made me just learn to put someone else before me. Before I had to put my military career, my military brothers, then it was my turn to put my career as an esthetician. However, when I became a mom, I had to take care of this human being. And when I got divorced, I remember actually I was going to school and I was managing, working part-time at the salon. And I remember he was in fifth grade and he told me, mom, you don't have to go to school. I do. He was asking me to slow down my life because I was always working, 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 working. And I realized, you know what? I only have him for 18 years. He's right. I can put him first. So I became the PTA mom. Well, not quite, but I did. You know, um, I became his chauffeur, his chef, his driver. Mom, I have debate. Mom, I have track. And I put my career not last because that's the beauty about entrepreneurship. I became an entrepreneur. I started working at a time for myself. I started working, you know, at a different pace. And that's the beauty. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you get to call the shots. You get to be your boss. But it was nice to explore the realm of owning your own business. And no, I can't not take this gig because my son has track today. And yes, he's definitely made me a better leader just watching him become 
a leader himself makes me want to become a better leader and show him that mom, you know, giving back to the community. Like that's something I love doing. Well, it sounds like you two are an amazing compliment to each other and are really helping each other uh, grow together through life and, and become the kind of people that you're both hoping to be. I think that's, that's really amazing. And it's, it's wonderful how you found a way to uh, not just balance all of those things you wanted to get together, but do them all in a way where you could thrive at, at all of them. So, so uh, congratulations on a, sounds like you've raised a really great kid and B uh, really put together a wonderful life for yourself and him as well. So, so let's play a game now. If you're okay with that, of course. This game is called Rapid Response, and I'm going to ask you a few questions. And all I'm looking for is for you to give me the first thought that comes into your head. And it doesn't have to be short, but let's just get the first thought that comes into your head as we do that. Is that okay? Okay, let's do it. All right, let's go. This is Jessica Vargas, Rapid Response. Your time begins. Now, podcast recommendation. The rescue swimmer, the real rescue swimmer. Okay. What are your feelings on pumpkin spice? Love it. Love it. Okay. Something we should all be paying attention to. suicide awareness okay yeah i think that's a good one i think uh, i don't think we we could be paying too much attention to that i think we all need to be focused on that okay so you have a choice here don't answer yet either your get psyched up song or what is your walk-on music okay okay uh i want to say everything goes my way that's a song I saw, I, I listen to all the time. Okay. Who is your biggest influence in life? My mother. Excellent. What is a book everyone should read? The Untethered Soul. Oh, that's a good one. I haven't heard of that. I'll have to check that out. What is the best fall activity in the Southwest? Hiking. Hiking? All right. Where is your next vacation going to be? Amsterdam in Croatia in two weeks. In two weeks, yeah. Well, Amsterdam will be great. I've been there once. It's it's amazing. I haven't been to Croatia, but that's on my list. So you'll have to let me know how that goes. What is an important trend to watch? An important trend to watch. God, I'm always behind the trends. My friends make fun of me for that. I still don't have a TikTok or a Snapchat. So I guess that's a hard one for me because I tend to be the last one to join the trends. Okay, that's that's a perfectly fine answer to that. And then finally, what's your favorite sports team? Cowboys. Dale, Dallas Cowboys, all right. Well, thank you for playing Rapid Response. Your answers were wonderful. It's a it's a way for us to get to know you a little bit more than the questions we we ask. So I'm very curious. What are some of the other lessons you learned from the military that you've carried with you into running your business? Time management. There was no such thing as being late. There's no, I got a flat tire. There is no excuse. Time management and accountability. Doing things right the first time, you won't have to do them again. As Marines, we're drill also on being professionals in looking the part. I want to say that the reason I became so successful in both of my businesses has been that I've always made sure I'm on time. My consistency is always on point. I make sure that I do things right. 
that I take pride in my work, that I give the best that I can give to my clients. And I take accountability if I do something wrong. If I failed, I let's say I double book myself and I have done that, then I will make it up. You know, I will take accountability. I will own my mistake, but I will make it up to that client. But professionalism that you learn in the military, tactfulness even. Uh, when I was an esthetician, I was working at this company and this client who is now my friend came in and she was just upset and I didn't take it personal. And she told me, everybody here sucks. I don't like your work, but I have one more service to get. And I said, so how's your day going besides everybody here sucks? Hopefully you like my work. And I did not take it personal. I did the best service I could get. And then she became my forever client. And now we're friends. I haven't perform a service on her, but now she literally invited me to her wedding. I've gotten to see her become a grandmother and it's being tactful. I had to learn that in the military and I was not tactful. I had to learn that, hey, if you're addressing a superior, you have to address them with respect. Even if you disagree with them, there is a way to say your point without being disrespectful. And I think there's so many lessons that we can learn just from our military career that transfer over. That's why when you hire a veteran, you know you're getting a quality product or worker. Yeah, there are there are definitely uh, professionalism and work skills that, that veterans bring that um, are becoming more and more rare I think in our society. And so that is something I, when I work with veterans, uh, I was actually up with the air force last week teaching a workshop and I kind of let them know you're going to go through this transition and the rest of the world's not like what you're used to here and how you react to that's going to make a real difference on how successful you are and, and how successful you are relating to others. When you, when you finally at the, you know, we can't be in the military forever. So at some point you're going to have to, work through that transition as you get out and, and how we deal with that and how we react to that will, will determine how successful we are. So, so do you have any projects you're working on right now that you're really passionate about? Yes. I am 14 chapters in, into a book called Guerrera, which translates to warrior. And it's a coming of age story. So it's a fictional book inspired by my life in the life of my mother. I'm first generation Mexican-American. And my mother was the first in her family to cross the border. She came to the United States at 17 in high heels and a mini skirt. And when she tells her story, it's hilarious because the coyote looked at her like, where are you going dressed like that? You're crossing the border, lady. Like, where are your running shoes? And I mean, she had watched Saturday Night Live Fever, you know, with John Travolta. And she thought she was like, you know, she wanted to make an impression coming to America. And back then, when she tells her story, it's not like how it is now. It was just a dirt separating the United States and Mexico. And I mean, as a 17-year-old coming to United States, leaving behind her country and learning a new language, a new life, but she gave us the opportunity to be born in this great country. Both me and my older brother joined the Marine Corps straight out of high school, and we served our nation. And I wanted to write a book about both of our journeys, yet I wanted to make it fictional because I wanted to be able to tell the stories of other people, not a memoir. So I, it's inspired by my life. However, it's also inspired by the life of my mother and it's combined. It goes back and forth into the past and into the future, merge in a very beautiful way. And I'm really excited about this book. And I, my dream is that one day this book will turn into either a Netflix series or a movie in I want to show the perspective of females in the military because we are the forgotten figureheads. I mean, 
I've gone to so many veteran organizations or veteran events where people just assume I'm the spouse. And then when they hear I was in the military and a Marine at that, they're just shocked. So I want to bring awareness that women serve too. And yes, we get deployed to a combat zone also. Yeah, I'm a little embarrassed to admit when I first met you a year ago, I think it was that that I had no idea, you know, it didn't uh, it, it didn't click with me right away that you'd been deployed to Iraq in the very early days as a Marine. So I'm a little embarrassed to admit that because I made some assumptions too, but you, you set me straight very quickly. So it's been an amazing year for you. You're writing the book. You're doing all this, you're doing all this great photography. You're, you're, you're working with veterans. Do you have any other goals you're trying to accomplish before the end of the year? Traveling. So now that I'm in empty nester, my son's in college, he's 18 I plan to travel a lot, but one of my goals is to possibly go live in Argentina for at least three months to six months and make it to Patagonia and capture some beautiful photography while finishing up my book. And also getting into a TED Talk or podcast, I want to get into public speaking. Growing up, I didn't like how I sounded. I didn't know, believe it or not, I was born in Los Angeles, yet my first language was Spanish and I didn't learn English until I was in fifth grade. And I got made fun of for that. You know, like I have had women taunt me because I have an accent and a heavy one at that. And I have a hard time pronouncing things correctly sometimes. And for a long time, I didn't like to speak in public. Then I took Toastmasters and I took oral communication in college and business speech. And I realized that our communication skills in communicating and just using your voice, which is something that as humans, we have the power to do so, can be so important. So I guess that's my next challenge is getting into public speaking and traveling. Well, I think those will all fit well together. I think uh, three months in Argentina to finish your book and write a couple speeches and take some beautiful photographs uh, for your business. Uh, I can't wait till you're back and we get to see you up on that stage talking about writing a book and some of your stories and and elaborating on some of the things you've talked to us today on the podcast. So what was one of the best mistakes you've ever made and what did you learn from it? Ooh, that's a great question. Shutting down. There was a time that I just, there was a time that I just shut down. After experiencing so much stress and pain, I started sleeping my life away right before I started attending veteran retreats. It, I, I didn't ask for help. I didn't surround myself with friends and I was just going to sleep, waking up, doing the bare minimums. However, as a Marine, I guess I can never not do something. So I started reading a lot and I started working on painting and art and what I learned is that life is too good to sleep it away to push forward to embrace the pain but to surround yourself with other people that might understand you to talk about it we don't talk about the bad stuff we like to always say we're good but it's okay to not be good. Sometimes life is going to test you. And I shut down. I shut down. However, I had really good people in my life. My best friend, my siblings, my mother, that basically my mom. One of the reasons that book is called Guerrera is because she always calls me a Guerrera, which means warrior. And she's from Guerrero, Mexico, which is warrior. It's in Mexico, if you're familiar with Acapulco or Iztapasihuatanejo from Shershark Redemption, that's the sleepy town he wants to go to. Well, she always tells me, you're a warrior. 
tú eres una guerrera. And she reminded me that, no, I still have fight left in me. I didn't want to feel pain. I didn't want to go through anything. So I shut down and I, it was a mistake to do so. However, when I rise, I rise like a phoenix and I decided enough sleeping. It's time to really own your life. And you know what? Recreate yourself, immerse yourself, feel this pain, embrace it and share it with the world. And that's how I found our veteran community here in Vegas. I remember I went to MVP, Merging Veterans and Players. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember that workout was so hard and I was in so much physical pain, but it just made me remember you're, I'm not going to curse because we're not podcast, but I remember I'm a damn Marine. I can do anything. This is no thing. Jessica, you got this. And then when I surrounded myself with my veteran community, I realized I'm not alone here. These people have my six. And yeah, I learned that don't, 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 you don't have to walk alone. Reach out for help. Get your support group because that's how we make it through life. Other people are our support group. None of us joined the military and did boot camp alone. We survived boot camp because we survived it with other soldiers, airmen, marine, sailors. That's how we earned the title. It wasn't given to us alone. We became part of something greater because we all endure the same amount of stress and pain. So that's what I learned. Well, I think you've got the topic of your very first keynote speech you're going to give as you're, as you're working on your speeches over the next couple of months. And Merging Vets and Players is an amazing organization. We'll get them linked up in the show notes so people can find them if they're looking for them, as well as some of the other organizations you've mentioned about the veterans retreats. Uh, we'll get all that linked up in the show notes. So who is someone you admire as a leader or in business? You know, I really like America Ferreira. I and Eva Longoria. They are my Latino superstar Latinas that have made a name for themselves, not just for acting, but becoming advocates for what they believe in. And I admire what they have done with their careers and how they use their platform. Secretly, that's who I want to produce my movie or Netflix series or play in my book. So, yeah, I definitely have to say America Ferreira and Eva Longoria have been an inspiration being Latinas that have made a name and have used their platform for good. All right. Well, ladies, if you're watching, Jessica's going to have a proposal for you. Uh... Uh, a script treatment uh, in a few months for her book. So, so please uh, jump in on that project before someone else snaps it up from you. Uh, you have so many great things planned. You've been doing so many great things, but I always like to ask people, what keeps you up at night? What are the, what are the really significant challenges that are on your mind? Goodness. <sighs> War. I don't want more of it. And when I read the news about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine or Israel and Palestine, and it just breaks my heart. I feel like there has to be a better way to disagree and to live together in this world. I feel like war is destructive not only to people's lives, but we're also damaging our earth. And we have one earth that is beautiful and it gives us everything we need to live in this planet. And then there has to be a way for humans to accept each other as different people with different beliefs. So war definitely keeps me up at night. Yeah, we're... We're living in a very tough time right now, and I think uh, what gives me hope is that there's artists like you out there who can show us the beauty in the world and help show us a path to be on a, 
a track where we can deal with each other with more empathy and, and be more productive in solving our problems. So please keep doing what you're doing and uh, help keep helping show us the way. So with all that stress, how do you stay calm and centered in the face of adversity? Yoga. Yoga, yoga, yoga in meditation. In gardening. Gartney, I actually, every time I feel like I'm not grounded, I go and play with the dirt and I get grounded. I mean, Mother Nature is beautiful that way. If you ever feel stressed, go to the beach, go to the park, go into nature. Nature heals. And that's what I do. I go into nature. I go hiking. I play with the dirt or I meditate and I do yoga. Yeah, we're so we're so fortunate here in Las Vegas because we have the best of all those worlds. We have the advantages of living in a city where we can go do things like yoga, but we're also just literally a few minutes from the mountains, and there are so many so many different opportunities to be outdoors. What are you excited about coming up in the future? I'm excited about this new chapter I'm in. The empty nester chapter, I love my son. And when I dropped them off at the dorms at UNLV, there was this sense of pride, accomplishment, and relief. Like I did it. I did it as a single mother. And I raised a good human. Like in my heart, I actually know he is going to do something great in life. So I'm excited to see what he does with his college education and with his life. But I'm also excited about what I can give back, how I can use my voice, my talent to improve this world. Well, it sounds like you've raised a great kid. It sounds like he's going to go off and do amazing things in the future. And we're all, we're all looking forward to hearing you use your voice. And I'm, I'm glad we got to hear a little bit of it today on the podcast. Um, who is, or what is someone or something you are grateful for? Like I said, my mother, I am very grateful for having a tough mom. She's been through hell. I mean, she raised four children by her own. I raised one child and I look at her all the time like, mom, how'd you do it? And we were little buttheads. We were rugrats. Like we were, especially me, I was the ringleader of always getting ourselves into trouble and pushing the boundaries. But I mean... The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And my mom was the black sheep of her family. I mean, she pushed boundaries. I mean, having the courage to define my grandpa, who did not want my mom to come to the United States at a young age of 17 and have a leap of faith, then everything she went through to give us a better life, opportunities by herself, there were times she would work two jobs and still make tamales on the weekends to sell just to provide. But she showed me that when there's a will, there's a way and never to let yourself fall down to look for opportunities everywhere. And having such a strong woman as a mother means the world. That's amazing. I I can't wait to hear more about her story. It sounds like she's amazingly powerful, amazingly strong, and we can see where you all get that. So as we wrap up, what is some advice you would give to future leaders or entrepreneurs, especially for people who are looking to share their experiences, their journeys as a creative like you are? You know that saying by Nike, just do it. Just do it. Put yourself out there. Have a leap. Take that leap of faith. Go for it. There's so many times that I tell myself the imposter syndrome kicks in and I'm like, who am I? What makes me so special? What makes my story so special? Or my art or anything. You never know what your work is going to do for someone else whose life you're going to change. I had this crazy opportunity 
with the Robert Irvine Foundation just because I did it. I was in Camp Pendleton photographing for one of my former staff and CEO's retirement when one of my Marine friends was there celebrating his reunion and it was sponsored by Robert Irvine Foundation. We went on this hike and I donated my work to pay it forward because they're amazing. They're reuniting military members, first responders, in giving back. So I wanted to pay it forward. I said, here's some pictures I took, use them as you want. And then they call me and ask me to photograph for them for other events. Just do it. Put yourself out there. Accept rejection. What's the worst that can happen? That's my favorite saying. They're going to say no, but it's that one yes that's going to change your life. So take that risk. You have nothing to lose. Excellent advice. And no matter how many times I hear it, I don't think it can be said too many times. It's to get out there, do it, take those risks, and and go go forward and do good things. So what else should we know about you and Jess V Art? It's online. I'm on Instagram under Jess V underscore 777 there's a link to my website and please purchase especially from the veteran collection because i will donate part of my commission to that veteran retreat that saved and helped my life and then just follow me so that when i publish my book you can read it yes we will get all that linked up and uh you may have seen already, I will be putting up there, Jess has given us a couple pages of her book, so I'll throw them up. If you haven't seen them already, I'll throw them up as B-roll as she's talking about the book, and you can you can try to read some of, some of what she's written uh, in those graphics. So, Jessica, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for telling your story, and thank you all for tuning in. If you liked hearing from Jessica, please reach out and thank her for joining us. Also, check out some of our other videos, and please like comment, subscribe. And if you know someone who could use this conversation we had with Jessica, please share it with them. We love having these conversations with all of you being part of it. So keep watching and building your leader's mindset onward and upward.